Thank you very much, Hannah. Welcome to uh, all of you, uh, our live audience here for Intelligence Squared. Also, welcome to the online audience watching the debate uh, via the Intelligence Squared website, who will doubtless be sending in their questions later uh, via Twitter. This is usually the David Dimbleby moment where he mentions things like hashtags, etc., that he clearly doesn't understand. Um, I'm not going to do that. Instead, let's uh, introduce our subject for tonight. It is uh, look west, not east. South America will be the 21st century's superpower. If the uh, premise uh, for this motion is that Latin America uh, does not get the attention it deserves because people are always looking elsewhere, then I have to say that uh, not just myself, but my own newspaper, I write for The Guardian, has a little taste of how that must feel uh, right now. Some of you may have noticed that while the Arab world and North Africa are burning up with revolution and military intervention, and while Japan is in turmoil after earthquake and potential nuclear meltdown, the Guardian has chosen to devote a month of coverage to a season in Europe, rather brilliantly. And so last week I was in Paris and interviewing, and then in Madrid, interviewing diplomat or one diplomat after another and politician, and each one of them asked the same question as I walked in, which was, you're a journalist, why on earth are you here? <laughs> um, so this is perhaps Europe suddenly having a flavor of perhaps what one half of this debate may suggest Latin America experiences uh, often. Um, I will also just uh, plant to have hovering in our minds uh, again, it may be more seized on by one side of our motion rather than the other. Uh, the uh, declaration from uh, a grizzled and veteran editor of the New York Times who had been taught through bitter experience uh, and said that Americans will do almost anything for South America except read about it. And uh, we may find some uh, contrary views to that uh, proposal this evening. So uh, that is the motion. Uh, you will be casting your vote at the end of the evening by tearing your ticket in two and voting with either the for or against slip. Uh, there, if you are a don't know, then you should place the entire ticket uh, in the ballot box. That counts as an abstention. Uh, and I also will be giving you, I know you've done a pre-vote, and I'll be giving you uh, the result of that after we've had the set piece uh, speeches from our speakers. Um, I'm glad to say the format is, and they will stick very strictly to it, that each speaker has eight or nine minutes. They'll speak from the podium. I will be quite hardline. Uh, two minutes before, I will give one, uh, two strikes of the glass, and one minute before, one strike of the glass, and after that, I will gesticulate wildly and generally embarrass you if you do not come back uh, away from the podium. So that's the procedure. There will be, then we'll open it up, as you all know, people who've been here before, uh, to questions and contributions from the floor and uh, a spirited debate at this end as well. So I'm going to introduce our speakers one by one uh, as they come up. So our first speaker who may uh, ascend to the podium is Parag Khanna, who's a senior research fellow in the American Strategy Program at the New America Foundation and is the author of the wonderfully titled How to Run the World, charting a course to the next renaissance. And he is, of course, as our first speaker, speaking for the motion, Parag Khanna. Good evening. Many of you are no doubt here because you were seduced by the image on the left side of this screen, this succulent, seductive lady, uh, and you might have hoped to see her or some uh, avatar of her up on this stage this evening instead of uh, seven men. Sorry to disappoint you. That said, she and what she represents has seduced the President of the United States. For while we all sit here this evening, President Barack Obama is in South America, in Chile, and en route to Brazil, no doubt seeking comfort and solace from the world's turbulence. What is his mission? He says it is to forge new alliances across the Americas, and he will need them to counter those stiff generals on the right side of this program this evening. Now, those generals and the Chinese superpower that they represent appear to be an unassailable force marching irreversibly towards global hegemony. But note that tonight's proposition is not that China or Asia represent the only superpower, but that South America will surprise us in becoming one. Now, ladies and gentlemen, geopolitics is a very unsentimental discipline. 
It doesn't care how many articles or books you've read about the rise of China. It doesn't care how much money you've invested in Asian mutual funds. It doesn't care how many hours and dollars you've spent on a Chinese nanny to teach, teach your kids Mandarin. <laughs> Geopolitics is about the relationship between power and space. Thus, tonight's debate should center on the elements of power, where and how they come together, and how they are executed, nothing more. It is already the case that the 21st century is, in fact, multipolar and multi-civilizational. More than one superpower means that no continent will emerge as the superpower, but there will be quite a few that can claim that they are superpowers. Indeed, the combination of military, economic, and diplomatic influence make the United States, the European Union, and China already superpowers. Their influence extends around the world. They are the three largest imperial units. They are models which are actively spreading themselves around the world. They have resources. They have ambition. Why has Latin America, why has South America so perennially been excluded from this conversation about geopolitics? Well, there's a naive and simplistic assumption that hegemonic power moves in cycles from east to west and now east again, ignoring the complex realities of how power the power of each depends on, in some ways, on the power of others. The second reason is that South America has for so long been considered a resource provider rather than a resource deployer. And the third reason is that the South American continent has been considered geopolitically inert and marginal and subservient, especially to the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, all of that has changed. First, China is not just rising by itself. It is bringing others with it. Latin America's booming exports to China are part of the reason why we can have this debate this evening about South America rising to the status of a superpower. According to Standard Chartered Bank, the trade between Latin America and Asia is the fastest growing of any inter-pair of regions in the world. And that trade is very balanced as well. So China is not, uh, so South America is not being bought or owned in some neo-colonial pattern such as many describe Africa today. To the contrary, China's rise is elevating South America, and it will continue to grow and benefit from that. Secondly, in an age of resource scarcity, it matters who controls the resources. South America represents a very sizable share of the Earth's total biocapacity. The Amazon rainforest is the world's lungs, and the continent is also the world's breadbasket producing most of the world's bananas, sugar, oranges, coffee, soybeans, and a major share of the world's beef and pork. It also has massive mineral deposits, silver, copper, lead, tin, zinc, iron ore, lithium, all of these in this very rich continent. The Western Hemisphere, in fact, as a whole, is on the cusp of energy and food independence from the rest of the planet. Canada, the United States, Mexico, Venezuela, and Brazil are all major oil and gas producers for a hemisphere that has only one billion people. And those resources are far less volatile than the Middle East, on which, in fact, China and Asia depend. In fact, Brazil itself may just have discovered as much oil as Russia has. And Canada is physically as large as Russia, except it works. <laughs> so in a century of resource scarcity, supply has the upper hand on demand. Third, South America previously had no leader, but today Brazil has emerged as a confident and mature international power. It is leading the creation of a union of South American nations. It has become active with Europe, across Africa, negotiating with Iran, and trading with China. No one really knows if China's economic figures are real, but ever more people are confident in the Brazilian real. South America's economy as a whole is already the same size as China's, but with only half the population. Due to the success of Chile and Brazil, there is a new left consensus across South America that has taken hold. It reverses centuries of political volatility in favor of a consistent pattern of social democracy, pro-poor investment, and a welcoming uh, climate for foreign direct investment. South America is, at a state, is in a state of peace, there are no active hostilities between its nations. It has relatively few countries and a common cultural heritage. No doubt, we look at South America and we see Hugo Chavez and his cantankerous rule. And he has almost led his nation into conflict with several neighbors, such as Colombia. But that has not materialized, very largely due to the mediation of powers such as Brazil. 
On the whole, Brazil's role has in fact been to animate Latin American leaders to stand up for themselves and be a part of this story of South America's rise. Now, like North America, South America is, is geographically isolated from geopolitical threats. Much as America rose during a period of splendid isolation, so too will South America. By contrast, Asia is very turbulent. The great power rivalries and suspicions that plague the region are alive and well between China, Japan, India, and South Korea. Asia is in fact leading the world's arms bazaar. All countries around China have dramatically increased their acquisition of military assets uh, to hedge against China's rise. Can you be so sure that China's commercial dominance and the Asian culture of deference will prevail over parochial interests and, and the, the parochial interests of proud nations that are armed to the teeth? I wouldn't bet on it. And leaving aside the rational powers, there are still major flashpoints in Asia, from Myanmar to North Korea, rogue regimes that could suck Asia's powers into military conflict. If World War III will take place anywhere, it will be in Asia. And China is not without domestic disturbances, from the waves of protest against corruption at all levels to the existential challenge of caring for its vast elderly as its race to clean up the environment continues, without, without taxing the society to the limit when it is currently choking much of its population. By and large, though, this entire case can be made without bashing Asia, which is, of course, the continent from which I come, despite my rugged Latin looks. <laughs> which brings us back to Obama's trip for this week, in which he went south, not east. America has realized that South America is its turnkey solution to its two greatest challenges, energy security and economic competitiveness. Obama's trip takes place on the 50th anniversary to the month of the Alliance for Progress, which sparked a very important wave of modernization and industrialization in South America in the 1960s. Today, America is launching a new alliance for progress in the region. American firms are relocating from Asia towards to Mexico and other Latin American countries, while partnerships in energy and trade are flourishing between America and Brazil. Together, North and South America will be able to compete with Asia and whose rise America has so willingly sponsored through the outsourcing and manufacturing is going to come back to America's time zone. In other words, South America will become a major 21st century superpower, also because America wants it to be one. The rise of the East, then, will reunite the West stronger than ever. But this West will include not only just the United States and Europe, but also a new third pillar, South America. Thank you very much. I hope the other speakers noticed the merest flick on the glass, and he was back in his seat. This is the rod of iron which I propose to use uh, this evening. Uh, our next speaker is himself a former editor, but one of the very few who actually can claim to have covered uh, South America seriously in his publication. Nevertheless, despite that, he's here to argue against the motion. He's the former editor of The Economist and author of Rivals, How the Power Struggle Between China, India, and Japan Will Shape Our Next Decade, here to argue against the motion, I suppose suggesting that we should look east rather than west, um, is Bill Emmett. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chairman, and to Intelligence Squared for having me here this evening. And I'd like to thank my friend Parag Khanna for making the first uh, speech against the motion. His uh, excellent uh, speech told us exactly what I think, which is that the 21st century should not be a century in, we, in which we look in one direction or the other. It should not be a century in which we choose China over Brazil, India over the United States. It should be, we should hope it will be, a century in which there will not be a single superpower, in which there will be many powers and perhaps a balance of those powers. Of course, looking to the future, we must remember 
always um, the wise words of uh, Sam Goldwyn, that we should never forecast, especially about the future. <laughs> we should look at the future with humility. Anyone who uh, looks at the speed of movement of events in North Africa and the Middle East since December, when the first spark came in Tunisia, anyone who looks at the potential impact on Japan of the earthquake and tsunami and nuclear disaster on March the 11th should be touched by that humility, by that sense that any forecast about the future is first of all something that of course would rule journalists out of a job since if it was all clear nobody would need to buy our publications or read our columns or our books but secondly that many things can and will change. But let me emphasize how profoundly pessimistic the motion actually is about that future. A motion that says South America will be the 21st century's superpower. Look west, not east. That is profoundly pessimistic because it assumes that the way we're developing now, which is to have the greatest uh, growth in living standards, in, human, uh, in hum humanity's income, in the movement of people out of poverty that's ever happened in history, thanks substantially to what's happening in the most populous part of the world, namely Asia, home to half the world's population, three billion plus people that this might come to an end, that this might achieve some sort of terrible denouement, that in the future this progress of the East might be severely interrupted. Now, in my book, as was kindly marketed by our chairman, um, I do say that there is rivalry between China, India, and Japan that will help to shape the future. But I do come from a background in which I think that competition can be a positive thing. There are arms races. There is real tension in Asia. There's real tension within the countries of Asia over future types of, of government that those countries should have, particularly in China. The speed with which the Chinese government and authorities have sought to snuff out any signs of protest, any signs of, uh, of uh, dissidents, uh, emulating events in Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, and elsewhere, shows how paranoid they are about these prospects. But still, to see the 21st century as being defined solely or chiefly by South America requires a very pessimistic view about the outcome of that story in Asia. Not just that there'll be interruptions, not just that there will be perhaps bits of instability as China democratizes, as India deals with its inequality, as issues such as the unification of the Koreas are played through. No, not just instabilities, but rather that this whole <coughs> process will come to some sort of a terrible conclusion. Because otherwise, a steady growth in the half of the world that we call the East should produce a very, very powerful countries in that part of the world that would be at least a balance to very powerful countries in the western half of the world. I believe we should be very positive about the prospects for South America, especially about Brazil, of course the dominant country of South America. The progress in the last 20 years in the politics of Brazil, the economic management of Brazil, the management of inequality within that country, the spread and development of its democracy have been spectacular and have been extremely welcome. And I hope very much that they will continue. But we must recognize the weaknesses also within that continent. Argentina is usually one president away from its next default. It is, 
it is the world's champion sovereign debt defaulter. Anyone looking for worries about the euro and future models for how you, how you do a sovereign debt default always reach for the file marked Argentina in their, um, in their file. Mexico, the second uh, great economy of the region, has the world's murder record. The crime in the Mexican border region, the drugs-related crime, is very sadly absolutely spectacular. Venezuela, Hugo Chavez, um, is a notable figure there, of course, and I am a proud <laughs> owner of um, his constitution. He came to The Economist to meet with some of us there, and when we started asking him about problems with his constitution, he said, yes, it's an excellent constitution, and reached into his pocket and pulled out a little blue book, very like Mao's little red book, and said, look, here it is, I wrote it, I'll sign it for you, and here's a copy. I have it on my bookshelves at home. So what I want to say about Latin America, about South America, is that they are not together a unified, nor um, actually especially well-integrated region of the world. They are a region with great potential, Brazil especially. I wish them extremely well, but I think we should recognize the pessimistic view that the idea that they will become the 21st century superpower, what this represents. The strength of Asia, the population of Asia, the speed of change in Asia, the great flexibility of the Asian economies and Asian societies is, I think, remarkable and impressive. We hope, and we should hope, that the development of that part of the world will spread and deepen and indeed spread into greater democracy. We should also assume and hope that the United States will be still the 21st century's superpower. It goes through its ups and downs. It's currently in a bit more of a down than an up. <laughs> but Winston Churchill's great uh, comment about America, about the United States, is worth always remembering, which is that America always can be relied upon to do the right thing once it has exhausted the alternatives. I will leave my colleagues to talk about the merits of Europe and of Britain, but I do think you should vote against the motion. You should be optimistic about the future, a future that is balanced between many strong countries, big and small, that doesn't follow the fashion that's been the fashion for the last few years of looking only for large countries to be important in the world, that perhaps looks back at the fashion prior to that in which the nation state was supposedly becoming less important, and hopes that in fact, superpower status will become much less important in the future, and we will have a much wider development, a much broader development, and one must hope, a peaceful world as a result. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Um, there can be no mistaking which side our next uh, speaker is on, a senior lecturer in law at Birkbeck College at the University of London. He is the author of, relevantly for our purposes, the ambitiously titled, What If Latin America Ruled the World? Our next speaker for the motion is Oscar Guardiola Rivera. May you live in interesting times, goes the saying attributed to the Chinese. Sounds like a good omen, doesn't it? Uh, but I'm told they intended as a curse. Looking at the most decisive events uh, of the century so far, from the water wars in Bolivia to a stolen election in America, the debacle of Iraq, the Great Recession or civil war and military intervention in Libya, it seems impossible not to agree that we do live interesting times. Whether you look at the happy non-democracies of the East or some of our own unhappy democracies caught between austerity and gloom, you may be inclined to think that the Chinese got it right, that 
to use uh, one of those profound terms we philosophers are so fond of, we're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> so where can we look for much needed hope and some inspiration? I say, look west, not east. Everyone knows interesting things are happening in the Americas. I have written a book, whole book, titled What if Latin America ruled the world, which describes some of the things that are happening there as well as their historical context, but most important of all, it explains why there are good reasons to choose what I call the happy democracies of the Americas as an image of hope and an example to the rest of the world. For instance, there is a strict parallelism between the grassroots mobilizations we have been witnessing recently in the Arab world and the grassroots mobilizations that took place in South America during the first decade of this century. In both cases, the people stood up against domestic as well as foreign dictates and took it upon themselves to realize the promise of freedom held back for so long. To the extent that Brazil and the other countries of South America have managed to enhance their capacities for self-rule while deepening their commitment to democratic and egalitarian institutions dating back some 200 years ago, the continent as a whole has become a beacon of freedom and hope around the world. The resistant nations of the Western Hemisphere have consolidated a unified voice around such institutions as Mercosul, UNASUR, IPSA, and other successful instances of regional and South-South cooperation, while at the same time overcoming the situation of dependence that characterized the period up to the late 1990s. Crucially, they have renounced violence and war as the norm of international and domestic relations, opting instead for a principle that stands in favor of equality and democracy. This new situation contrasts sharply, very sharply, with instability and non-democracy elsewhere. This is why, as he toured South America, US President Barack Obama was able to hail Brazil or Chile as an example everywhere in the world, which shows how to transform itself into a vibrant democracy, which shows that a democracy provides freedom and opportunities to the people, as he put it. But this is also why Obama knew he could not pretend the United States would ever again deal with Latin America as it had done in the past, in terms of dictates, as if South American countries were America's backyard. You know interesting things are happening when the president of the lonely superpower has to acknowledge that, realistically speaking, the best he can hope for is an equal partnership between his country and the countries of South America. That, in a way, America needs the countries south of the border more than they need the US because, among other things, there is a whole Latino nation within the United States which in demographic terms already doubles the rest of the population and will triple or quadruple its presence in the US by 2050. Hope didn't come to Latin America. We made it our own. But hope in Latin America is always tempered by sobriety. Our optimism illuminated by a clear memory of past failures and current challenges, some of our own making, others associated with a long and not too distant history of colonialism and Finnish projects, broken promises and intervention. Also in this respect, Latin America's leadership matters. We are less confident than many of our Euro-American counterparts in the inevitability of multilateralism in the modern world. This may lead towards a more antagonistic view towards a world order based on a balance between five or six powers calling all the shots, but also towards more ambitious goals concerning our regional and international entities. This has been exemplified in the position taken by Latin America vis-a-vis -vis the international, finan international financial institutions earlier on and more recently in the wake of the 2008 global crisis. In its calls for a complete overhaul of the post-war arrangement, its leading role in the negotiations that led to the declaration of Tehran in May last year, or in the global partnership dialogue launched by Brazil and the United States last February. In all of these cases, the point is the same, to interact with the rest of the world, with America in particular, as sequels. This is the thesis of my book. The combined power of the two Americas brought ever closer by a common libertarian history, economic ties, share the space and demographics will give any abstract nation with pretensions of hegemony a run for its money. 
<laughs> this is why I believe you should look west, not east. It is no surprise that in the last global survey conducted by the BBC World Service in 27 countries around the world, the positive opinion about the influence of countries such as Brazil has increased from 40% to 49%, while negative views fell three points to 20%. In contrast, China's positive rates fell six points this year to 39%, with 40% rating it negatively. I have no intention to deny the many achievements of the East, particularly in respect to the millions of people who have been lifted out of poverty in recent years, or to demonize it. We should not fall for the false dilemmas or us versus them, Manichaean choices rehashed by people unable to understand that the world has moved on. These people lazily hang on to the tired mantras of the threatening order, gloom and decline. Declinists fail to acknowledge that no one is seeking to replace the United States, that it has no real competitor and that it will continue to play an important military and cultural role in the coming years. Alas, from the so-called rise of China or Brazil and the rest of South America, it does not follow the decline of the West, just as the rise of the West in the 15th century did not follow solely from China's decision to turn inwards. If there, is any, if there was any decisive event all those centuries ago, it was the encounter between peoples from Asia, Africa, Europe, and the Americas. We live with the consequences of that encounter. Some were dire, and we should not deny them in the name of some mystical idea of progress. Others, still unfolding, point towards the enhancement of what is best about us all. Exclusively peaceful relations with the rest of the world a model that connects democracy with inclusive growth, employment creation, and international interaction based on diplomatic solutions, perhaps even some non-modern solutions to our very modern problems, cooperation to reduce famine and poverty, and to create more democratic mechanisms to deal with global questions. These, my friends, are not mere ideals. This is Latin American practice. This is the reason why Latin America is being hailed as an example to the world, and this is why you should look west not East. But if you still need some convincing, let's make fun of philosophy once more. As you know, we philosophers love engaging in very complicated thought experiments, so let me try to conclude this evening something much less sophisticated. Let's call it a gut-feeling experiment, inspired by the publicity for this event. Look at these images and tell me which way you would go. <laughs> would you choose him or him? <laughs> or perhaps you might prefer him. Would you go for these strong ladies? Or these strong ladies? <laughs> or perhaps you would prefer her? Who could blame you? I won't. I know where I stand. And I believe you know which way your vote will go tonight. Thank you. <laughs> The diary story almost writes itself about the all-male panel assembled by Intelligence Squared, which ended up flashing pictures of scantily clad women on the screen. I won't leak it if you won't. Um, our next speaker is, like the first against the motion, a journalist, also a graduate of The Economist, where he reported from Brussels, Bangkok, and Washington, but not, I notice, from South America. Uh, he is now the chief foreign affairs columnist of the Financial Times, where he's a must-read, and the author of Zero Sum Futures, American Power in an Age of Anxiety. Here to oppose the motion, Gideon Rachman. Thank you very much, Jonathan, and thank you for inviting me. Ladies and gentlemen, Latin America is a great place, as you've just seen with those uh, spectacular visual aids. I'm afraid <laughs> I don't have pictures of scantily clad dancers or hatchet-faced Chinese generals to entertain you with. But what I do want to do is to explain to you why, although Latin America is a very positive, optimistic place at the moment, there is no way that it will rule the world or indeed be the superpower of the 21st century, not politically, not economically, and not even intellectually. Now, having poured a bit of cold water on that, let me start with some kinder words. Let's start with what's, with what's going right. 
I was, I was uh, actually in Brazil last week, so never let it be said that I don't go the extra mile to do my research for Intelligence Squared debates. <laughs> um, and like, like uh, Jonathan, I had the experience of thinking, you know, I write about international affairs. Why am I actually in Brazil <laughs> rather than... Uh, you know, somewhere a little bit more in the news. Uh, but then I noticed that Obama was also in Brazil, so I thought, well, obviously, I've got something right. And you can totally understand why people are paying attention to the country and to the continent, and why people in Brazil are so upbeat at the moment. The economy is growing strongly. The Brazilian finance minister has just claimed, a little prematurely, that it is now the world's fifth largest economy, but even if it isn't quite yet, it soon will be. Unlike in the West, where we've had an 30 years marked by rising inequality. Brazil, which has been a, a, a byword for, for inequality, actually is now seeing falling inequality. The Bolsa Familia, this program of uh, social transfers, is a highly successful, much admired social program. Brazil's commodity exports, as Parag pointed out, are booming, foreign reserves are high, the currency is strong, in fact it's too strong, they're complaining bitterly about it. Rents and bankers' salaries, if that's a sign of health, are now higher in Sao Paulo <laughs> than in New York. The World Cup's coming, the Olympics are coming. What could go wrong? Brazil is certainly fashionable. It's part of the most fashionable geopolitical uh, arrangement in the world, the BRICS. Uh, but unlike the other BRICS, it's not scary. It's not scary like China or scary like Russia, and it's certainly less chaotic than India. So Brazil is the cuddly brick. It's the one that everybody likes and that they give all the tournaments to. Now, look, look more broadly at the continent again. It's a positive story, growing fast. Countries that were once famous for terrible conflicts have often outgrown them. Chile, successful, prosperous democracy. Peru's beaten the shining path. Colombia's largely beaten the drugs cartels. And continent-wide, this is, as has been said, a conflict-free zone. The wars that disfigured Central America are over. But this will still not be the Latin American century, let alone the Latin American decade or whatever you want, for several reasons. The first is simply sheer size. The total population of Latin America is just shy of 600 million. That's less than half the population of China alone. And when it comes to economic weight, size does matter because the Chinese economy at the moment is just, uh, as somebody pointed out, the size of the, the, the Latin American economy, but China's growing much faster than Latin America. China's been growing at an average rate of eight to 9% a year for the last 30 years. It may not be sustainable for, for the next 30 years, probably won't be, but it's got a momentum behind it that Latin America simply doesn't have. Brazil, as, as I, where I was last week, they're, they're growing at 7%, but they say not really sustainable, probably 4 to 5% is our natural rate of growth. Maybe that's more healthy, but if China's with one population, a huge population is growing at twice the rate of Brazil, you don't really need to, to do the mathematics to, to work out what's, what's going to happen. The, the sheer economic weight of Asia is just going to be much, much larger than that of Latin America. And China is not actually that anomalous. India is also growing at 8 to 9% a year, another country of over a billion people. So the sheer economic weight of Asia is going to completely dwarf that of Latin America. And political power does flow from economic power. It's not a complete mathematical translation that this, side of, this size of economy equals this amount of political power. But look at the polit growing political clout already of China in, in the world. I mean, the Brazilians are, are, are locked into an economic relationship with China that they're not entirely happy about because they are the commodity supplier. Their manufacturers are all going out of business because Chinese goods are out competing them. And certainly, you know, it's the Chinese who are going around Europe offering to buy up Greek bonds or fund Portuguese debt, not the Brazilians. So that's the economic side. But then I think one also has to look, as well as making this comparison with Asia, you have to look at Latin America, which although it has a lot going for it, also does still have many weaknesses. Inequality is coming down, but it's still one of the most unequal parts of the world. The drug gangs may have been beaten in Colombia, but they're rampant in Mexico, where 28,000 people have died since the Calderon administration launched its drug war, a much higher civilian toll than even in Afghanistan. And in fact, the Mexicans will tell you, I'm not sure if it's true, perhaps the Brazilian ambassador can put me right, but they will take you aside and say, actually, the murder rate's higher in Brazil, and it's higher in Central America. So this is quite a violent continent. Education is another big problem. On the PISA rankings of school attainments in maths and literacy, Brazil comes very low down the rankings, and Brazil is half the continent. 
It became 53rd of 62 in, in reading and maths. The US, which thinks it has great problems in those areas, is in the 20s. Britain is in the 20s as well. And if you take the famous Shanghai rankings of the world's top universities, there isn't a single Latin American university in the top 100. Finally, ideology. Oscar, to judge by his book and by his, his uh, speech tonight, believes that Latin America represents in some ways a new, slightly more humane form of globalization and a new way of approaching economics. But it seems to me that a lot of the success of modern Latin America has actually just entailed an embrace of the globalization that we already have. Lula's first trip as president of Brazil was to the World Economic Forum in Davos, the festival of globalization where all world leaders go and pay court to the same investment bankers and multinational executives. And if you go to the Latin American dinner at Davos, it's stuffed with presidents there who basically embraced the globalization consensus. The Latin American populist left, still romanticized by many in Europe, I'm afraid represents a dead end. For those who doubt it, consider that Hugo Chavez was the 2009 winner of the Muammar Gaddafi International Prize for Human Rights. Uh, that's not one that you want to keep on your mantelpiece. So Latin America is a great place, it's an exciting place, it's an optimistic place, but it's certainly not going to run the world. And Latin Americans, frankly, should be grateful for that. Given the current travails of the US, running the world is not all it's cracked up to be. Later on, uh, Gideon, perhaps you'll share with us some of the previous winners of the uh, Muammar Gaddafi Prize for Human Rights. I think there may be some, some here tonight, some, here tonight <laughs> some resident in this country, perhaps even some former prime ministers of this country, I was wondering. So we'll have to hear from you who the, next, uh, who the previous winners were. Our next speaker is an advocate for South America, not just for fun here this evening, but that is how he uh, earns his living. He is a trained engineer, but also one of the most seasoned diplomats in London, representing the country hailed as the superpower of this uh, region that might indeed itself become the superpower of the 21st century. The country you just heard being referred to as the cuddly brick, uh, the ambassador of Brazil to London. Please welcome our next speaker, His Excellency Roberto Jewaribe. <laughs> Good evening, and thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Of course, uh, the first thing to consider is the fact that no, no one can question the fact that we are entering to a very clear phase of multipolarization in the world, and that there will be no single superpower. We are going to have different focuses of power. And in fact, superpower is an acronym, is a name, or a category that does not appropriately apply to Latin America or to Brazil. We do not aspire that. We aspire to be in a, in a world of more equilibrium, of more cooperative stances. But this is a very strong posture. This is a posture that has transformational elements in it and which is required to improve the world. And I think looking to South America, you will find that we will have contributions in order to generate the type of dialogue and intervention that is required to optimize the possibilities of a more multilateral, multipolar scenario. I think this is one of the, of the important elements of, of, of uh, uh, South America. We are witnessing, of course, a major transformation. I think China is one of the countries, perhaps the country that has pushed for that transformation and opened the doors for others to become visible. Brazil amongst those, South America amongst those. The major elements of transformation that China have brought, has brought are very important. Among those, I would say that to become a very important country, it's no longer necessary to be a developed country. China is a developing country, will be a developing country for a very long time, but it's a determining country in the international scenario. This applies to very, a number of other elements, a number of other countries, and that goes for India as well. It certainly goes for South America and for Brazil. The advantage of South America in relation to other regions is that we are, without any doubt, living in the most extensive, cohesive, and homogeneous region of the world. There's no geographical space 
that is as homogeneous, as cohesive as Latin America is because of its history, because of its problems, because of its challenges, because of its population. And the language is also a common ground. Everybody knows that Spanish is a variation of Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> we have enormous elements of, of, of importance uh, that contribute uh, to the fact that we can really place and, and have an important role in this place, in the world. Demography, which has been placed and stated as a deficit for Latin America, is to a certain extent a deficit, I concur with that. But let's say if Brazil had the, the demographic density of Bangladesh, we would have 10 billion inhabitants in Brazil. And so demography is also, in a, ch in a challenge for growth, demography also presents an enormous benefit to, to, to Latin America. We have two or three major issues of the 21st century, which are clearly resolved in South America and Latin America in general, which are environment, energy, and water. South America energy is, is, a, is a, an enormous surplus. We provide about 30% of the world in, in growing because the prospects of additional uh, finds in oil in Brazil alone are already very significant, but it's not just Brazil. Many other countries are beginning to find very significant deposits of oil in that region. Renewable energy is fundamental. Water, South America provides 30% of the renewable water in the world. Water is a scarce uh, element in Asia. It's going to become even scarcer. And Latin America has, Brazil alone has 15% of all the renewable water of the world. This is a fundamental element. Commodities are not just going ahead and producing something because you have the land, the space, uh, or the air, or the sun in, as in agriculture. Commodity requires in agricultural production, require competitiveness, require investment. The reason why Brazil and many other Latin American countries have become so competitive in commodity exports is because of an enormous amount of research that has gone into agricultural development. The breadbasket of Brazil today is the center, center part of the country, which was cons considered completely inept for agricultural production uh, until about 30 years ago. So it's not just a question of having uh, uh, a lack of capacity in research and technology, which is a problem, I must confess, but it's the fact that we have devoted enormous energies to, the, uh, to uh, maximizing benefits that are structural in our region. Another very important element relates to the cultural dimension, which I already mentioned. Uh, all of, of Latin America is very diversified from the point of view of the cultural formation of each country. We are a very syncretic culture. That is very much the case in Brazil. That brings multiple cultural references in play. We have the ability, and this is not exclusive of South America, India to a certain extent has the same benefit, of being able to look into things from different angles which provides a much better possibility of understanding amongst, not just inside, but also uh, in relation to uh, international relations in general. Uh, we have been uh, working very hard to change the international scenario, and we believe that the, the, the format that is really taking place and taking shape today, which is the multipolarity, is extremely beneficial to the type of vision that we bring to this matter, which is essentially the idea that we must have horizontal and not vertical relations. Another element which we think is fundamental and which provides a, a, a certain novelty in this space is the idea of doing away with the like-minded countries agenda, which has dominated international relations for the past 20, 50 years maybe, after, after, after the, the, the Second World War. Like-minded agenda has not resolved the political or even the, 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 the economic or the development issues in the world. We favor, on the contrary, a diverse-minded country uh, 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 coalition, which will be able to provide different perspectives to common and traditional problems that have not actually been solved. Another element which I think is important to consider when you look at the 21st century is, is to create and to distinguish between structural and conjunctural problems. Latin America and South America in particular does face, and they, we do face, significant conjunctural limitations. Uh, many of those have been mentioned. There are uh, limitations in relation to education. There are limitations in relation to infrastructure. There are limitations in relation to science and technology. 
But these are limitations that are essentially conjunctural limitations and not structural limitations. What do I qualify as structural limitations? Long-term impediments to continued growth. Demography is one. Uh, natural resources is another. Availability of water and others uh, are continuous. And also the, 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 the difficult uh, geographic and uh, uh, geopolitical uh, environment. That has been already stated. South America uh, is very much at peace. It's a country that has a number of minor irritants in, in, in relation to uh, national questions. But it's essentially been resolved throughout the 19th century. Uh, on the other hand, we also have an enormous degree in each country of national uh, integration. This is a crucial element in the definition of what the nation is. How many big countries in the world do not have any problem of national integration? I will tell you, two, the United States and Brazil. All other countries of a big size have enormous problems of national integration, which constitute significant barriers and problems to their own development. Most Latin American countries present one difficult challenge, which is being superseded, which is social integration. And this, again, has been already qualified. We do have problems of social integration. But the advances in the policies that have been carried out, not just in Brazil, but throughout the region, have placed Latin America on the other hand of what is taking place all around the world, which is growth with increasing income distribution. We have not witnessed that anywhere else in the world, be it the developed world, be it the other parts of the underdeveloped or the developing world. Growth with income distribution is a characteristic that we will find today only in South America. And of course, there are other cultural elements which we believe are very important. Uh, we have a very clear national identity in relation to literature, music, uh, and uh, a very general optimistic, you know, in a, I'm not very favorable to the methodology that is applied in many of these surveys, but one of those that came out recently said that of the 10 most optimistic countries in the world, nine were in, in South America, in Latin America. <laughs> mm. And of course, uh, we are, I, just the numbers are already very representative. Today, uh, South America, according to figures of the IMF or the uh, uh, CIA, already represents <laughs> the fourth largest economy in the world after NAFTA, which is the biggest, Europe, which is the second, and China, which is the greater. Of course, we have a much lower population than any other of these combinations, but we already are a very significant economic power. And in terms of commodities, the numbers have already been provided. I could add a list to those in which we are very representative. And finally, of course, we must say that we have been for a long time and hopefully will continue to be the world's most important powerhouse in football. Thank you. <laughs>
As I've been wandering around the country, I've been finding this tremendous upsurge of enthusiasm for the study of the Portuguese language. People basically realizing that as Brazil takes its role as that great new continental regional power, they need to get in on the ground floor and start learning the language. Well, that would be a great idea, except that as we know, that isn't really the world as we see it. If people are taking on a new global language, the stark reality is that it is Mandarin. That is the language that people are taking on board, whether it's the nannies, as Parag mentioned it, or anyone else who's bringing it to children, but it is the Chinese language that seems to have caught people's imagination. If you go around the world and say, falu português, you may get a pleasant smile, but if you go around saying, wujiang zhongwen, you're gonna start actually doing business. And I think that reality, that division between the two is really where my part of today's argument lies. Because I do want to suggest that in the world order as it is, and we started with Parag on the other side talking about the reality of global geopolitics rather than as we might want it to be, it's clear that in terms of world order and shaping of that order, it is the East, and unashamedly I will say that we're talking here about the big Asian superpowers, it is the East that is going to shape the next century, and not, to my regret, since the, uh, I'm as attracted by these pictures as anyone else, the world of South America. It is going to be a place which is shaped very much by a variety of new powers that have something to say and have the clout to make it happen. And one argument that I think put forward, particularly by Parag Khanna, that I need to uh, need to, uh, to combat immediately is the idea that the Indias, the Chinas, the Japan, still the third world, world's biggest economy, mustn't forget about, uh, to forget about it even is declining, the idea that something called an Asian culture of deference is going to prevent these powers from really having their say. I think about prominent Asian thinkers who have changed the world, Mao Zedong, Mahatma Gandhi, Parag Khanna. None of these people, <laughs> none of these people could be described in any ways as in deference to the way of thinking that the world is, is described by. Rather, they are people who have seized and changed the world. And it is with those figures that I really have to make the core of my argument now, which is that with great regret and great respect to our colleague, the ambassador, and others here who hail from the uh, continent of South America, in the end, and for the moment, and for the time that I can foresee, the, the global attraction of Latin America is still going to be relatively globally limited, as opposed to something that I think is more universalizing on the Asian side. Let's take the words that, um, we've, we talked about the cultural side of things. So let's talk about one of the big transmitters of an Asian style of culture around the world, and that is the Bollywood movie. Those of you who have not yet enjoyed the pleasure of a four-hour movie extravaganza with singing, dancing, and incredibly um, dubious plot lines have a treat in store for them. But it's very clear that it's the Bollywood movie that has shaped cinema around the world, not the other way around. If one goes to Latin America, the movie tunes from those um, uh, from those Bollywood movies are well known enough that people don't actually know they come from India. The same is true in the Middle East. The same is true even in China. This is a universalizing cultural phenomenon that comes from Asia. If one looks at, uh, I don't know how much of your time you spend hanging out with 13 or 14 year olds, and I think I might uh, uh, lead to some raised eyebrows if I claimed that much of my time was spent in that, uh, in, in that way, uh, at least not while people are, are watching on the, on the web stream. But if you talk to teenagers about the cultural impact, you will hear over and over again the word manga. In other words, a Japanese form, also known as the anime, which comes from a very different cultural and visual way of seeing that has gone global that has gone viral wherever you go in the world, and I'm sure that, that includes Latin America, the pictures, the culture, the, um, the, the visuality of the manga and the anime are yet another example of how a cultural meme, a formation from the Asian side, has spread across the world. In contrast, the things that are uniquely and distinctively culturally South American still, I think, have a long way to go before they have that wider transformative power. I am, for instance, a great fan of the 1960s expressionist Argentinian film director Leopoldo de Torre Nilsson. I'm sure everyone else on the panel is as well, and we shall be swapping some anecdotes later about his greatest, uh, greatest movies, uh, La Mano en la Trampa, masterpiece. On the other hand, I think it's fair to say, and I made a slightly unfair comparison there, that Latin American literature, 
cinema, even football, where perhaps there's a different sort of cultural formation, either tend to attract um, uh, uh, praise because of the cultural specificity of what they do, or else because like football, they are something that is so globalized already that there isn't necessarily anything very Latin American um, about them. Um, if we think about the way in which icons, in way, the ways in which uh, societies are understood um, are put forward, let's think about a figure like Mahatma Gandhi. If you're going to mention anyone who's associated with um, uh, progressive political change in our own era, perhaps Nelson Mandela, but perhaps across the century, Gandhi comes to mind more than anyone else as a great liberator. Simon Bolivar is also a figure of great interest and importance who I have. I highly respect, but I think it's fair to say that he doesn't get the instant name brand recognition that a Gandhi has around the world. Similarly, if you go around the world looking for cultural symbols of that kind of cultural change, people may well point to the Confucius Institutes, who, uh, uh, which um, have been set up in over 100 countries around the world to try and spread the study of Mandarin. I asked a friend of mine who was here tonight, um, this evening, if, she, if I, she had ever heard of Confucius, at which point she pretty much you know, slapped me across the face for asking such a stupid, uh, stupid question. She slaps me across the face quite a lot, to be, uh, to be fair. <laughs> I then asked her if she had heard of Bernardo O'Higgins, you know, the great Chilean liberator, and I have to say on that particular occasion, she clearly hadn't. In other words, there are some universalizable cultural tropes, memes, ideas that I think are much more coming from the Eastern than the Western side of our cultural universe. And I fear that that will be the case for some time to, uh, to come. The reason for this has been touched on by some of the fellow speakers on this side, and so I won't repeat where we've gone already. But I think it is the fact that the East, and particularly India, China, and Japan, are going to dominate the way in which the next superpower has been formed, uh, is going to be formed in the next century. And that is in virtual space, in cyberspace. Whatever we might like to believe, the reality is that Latin America is not at the moment and is not in the near future going to be dominant in the virtual reality that will shape all the ways in which we interact. When the next version of the IP addresses, the internet protocol is being discussed as it is right now, those discussions are taking place with Beijing. They are not taking place at the same level with Brasilia or with Buenos Aires. And that's largely because of the things that the ambassador himself acknowledged. Um, in other words, that the educational level, the infrastructure, the things that absolutely make the formation of the educational superpower of the next century are happening in China. They're happening in India, places like Peking University, the Indian Institutes of Technology, but not yet in Brazil, Argentina, or the other countries of that continent. And in a country, China, where even despite the authoritarian restrictions on freedom of speech, which I suspect everyone in this uh, room would, uh, would frown upon, there are 410 million users of the internet growing daily, larger than the population of the entire United States, and they are creating a new way of interaction that will shape the nature of that next superpower. So I think in the last resort, if we want to think about the way in which the next century is going to do, log on to the internet, find out which is the language that is being used most frequently aside from English and actually coming up on the outside. And with great re regret, the language is not Portuguese, it's not even Spanish, it's Mandarin. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you to Rana Mitter and all our speakers, all of them admirably uh, concise. I hope that will, you'll regard that as a model as we now open up the debate. You heard arguments on my right here uh, for the motion, ranging from the notion that the combined power of North and South America will be uh, awesome, the notion that the economy of South America already matches that of China, and the argument that Spanish is a mere variation of uh, Portuguese. On my left, against the motion, you heard the uh, argument that uh, the region is, with a heavy heart, a byword for uh, debt, murder, and dictatorship. Uh, you also uh, heard the suggestion that size does matter and that the population of South America is just too small for uh, superpower status. And you heard the call to look at the language people around the world are learning, and it isn't Spanish or Portuguese. So, so those are some of the spirited arguments made uh, just now. Before you heard those, you did vote, and I'm going to give you the result of that pre-vote. It is the perfect kind of result for a good debate evening, because the, there were uh, 
for the motion 236 votes, those who did believe that we should indeed uh, look west, not east, and against the motion, very finely balanced, 279. But the reason why I say it's the ideal uh, result for a good evening is that the very large number of don't knows reached 201. And it is those 201 floating voters that our six speakers will do their best, I'm sure, to woo and persuade this evening. Now is the chance for some of those voting voters and others to make their case. Uh, well, let's get as many of these in as we can. Let's see some hands. Uh, there will be people with microphones who hopefully we can get to you. Well, there's somebody straight out of the block there. If, yeah, if you can go to the gentleman there with the blue shirt. I will not discriminate against people up there at the top, so uh, in the even more expensive seats, perhaps. Um, so we'll go with you first. Any other hands that are coming up? Well, let's hear our first speaking. Um, I would love to believe in Mr. Guardiola Rivera's future of, uh, of a humane social democratic hegemony in Latin America. But one thing that hasn't been addressed so far, I think, is the 60 years history of the United States intervention in Latin America, supporting sometimes overtly, sometimes covertly, uh, tyranny, um, tyrannical regimes in defense of its own interests. And we're not going to have Obama forever. We might well have a very right-wing, very reactionary president next, and perhaps for some time to come. We're going to have diminishing resources. We're going to have economic crisis. What is going to stop the United States from once again intervening in the politics of South America to support its own interests and crushing that hope which has been outlined tonight? Thank you. If you get the microphone just two rows behind you, there was somebody with a hand up there. Yeah, we'll get the microphone. While, that's, while the microphone's reaching, we'll go up to the top here. Yeah. Uh, oh, it works. Um, if we think of uh, being a superpower as the exercise of hard power, I'd like to ask the four panel how a continent could ever be regarded as a superpower. Just explain what your doubt is. What, well, you doubt whether a uh, what I mean, what I, by, by which I mean, how can a number of countries ah. actually directly intervene uh, and exercise power uh, w w as opposed to uh, America, which is obviously one country, and China, which is With also one only one country. under one command. Very good. Thank you. We've got the third one here. No one's mentioned how uh, different political systems might impact the development of, say, the Far East, or China in particular, compared to South America. I refer to a communist system in the former and a, in general, more democratic system in the latter. Second, and I'd like to uh, comments from the panel, second question is something that uh, Janelle Ferguson in a talk a couple of weeks ago referred to, when he referred to his six killer apps um, that had um, explained the dominance of the West, and that one of them was the Protestant work ethic. Maybe the panel might like to comment on how um, the Chinese work ethic uh, and the uh, religion that underpins that um, might differ from the primarily Catholic um, work ethic in South America. So two different questions for the panel. Are you suggesting uh, people in South America don't work as hard? as? Not at all. I asked the panel to comment on that. <laughs> Very good. I just thought we were straying slightly into Jeremy Clarkson territory there, <laughs> who um, caught the attention. Well, of course, Central America, he was talking about Mexico. Uh, and, and offering a little national stereotype there, but we're not straying into that territory. Why don't we go with the um, uh, first question, which uh, I'll put to the people who are against the motion. Uh, first of all, this one, because the other two, I think, relate to people who are for the motion. Let's just start with you, Bill Emmett, on the 60-year history of Latin American intervention, uh, intervention in Latin America by the United States. The questioner said there's been a long history of that. What's to stop there being a return to that kind of meddling? Let's hear, hear you on that, and then I'll... Uh, well, um, nothing completely, but uh, what's, uh, what's the reason why we should expect it to intervene um, again in the future? The, the past history uh, was substantially about the Cold War. Um, uh, the United States wasn't the only outside power seeking to intervene in the politics of Latin America. It was, unfortunately, a kind of proxy battleground between um, the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Looking into the future, uh, I think we could uh, ask what's the interest of, of the United States in, um, in treading over there? They've been pretty reluctant to take part in the intervention in Libya. They're scarred in Iraq and Afghanistan. Why would even Sarah Palin um, uh, intervene in Latin America? Does Sarah Palin know where Latin America is? <laughs> 
you can't see it from Alaska. You know, you know what, is, what is so amazing about that? Please. What is so great about that is that you got to laugh even before you'd mentioned the joke just by saying her name. Did I you know, that? that's right. That says something perhaps about London audiences. You get to laugh just with saying the name. There we, let's um, put to you, uh, Oscar Guardiola Rivera, this question about how can we speak uh, meaningfully about a superpower um, if it's made up of lots of countries rather than one, and particularly in terms of hard power, military power, there obviously isn't one single military command. So how can we meaning, meaningfully speak about a superpower South America? Uh, the uh, ambassador of Brazil already uh, pointed out uh, that uh, one of the advantages uh, of the Americas as a whole, not just Latin America, is uh, the cultural homogeneity. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the most interesting stories of the next uh, 30 or 40 years is going to be the Hispanicization of the United States. Nobody's taking that into account. This is the reason why the United States is not going to intervene in Latin America in the near future. Really. We're talking about demographics, where Latinos are, where they are, who are they voting for, who are they going to continue to vote for. Which means that the idea uh, that some uh, Sarah Palin might get into office is not as likely as many people think. The cultural homogeneity of uh, Latin America is a strength, intellectual strength, cultural strength. Mean that for us it's much easier to interact with one another and as a unity than it is in any other region in the world. We Hispanic speakers in Latin America do not need to learn Portuguese. We speak our portuñol and Brazilians understand us. They speak their Portuguese, and we understand them. We have a common history. Ethnic-wise, we have plenty in common. I don't know which 13-year-old is my friend on the left talking to. I was, I was, uh, I was watching uh, anime, manga anime, when I, was, when I was a kid. But now I ask my 10-year-old uh, daughter, who's English, Absolutely West Country girl. And she listens to Shakira. <laughs> that sense of universality, that sense of universality is what allows us to act as a unity. But most important of all, we are changing the terms of the conversation when it comes to geopolitics. And that's what we must do. Geopolitics cannot continue to be about hard power and war as the norm of international relations. It cannot, not because I, I, I don't, you know, I have some ideal idea of the future, but actually because it is unsustainable. The idea that you can sustain islands of affluence amidst the oceans of the wretched of the earth by means of force is completely bonkers. Uh, Parahana, do you want to come in on this particular yeah. point? I just want to add one very important uh, uh, additional point to what Oscar said, which is that we're having this conversation about South America becoming a superpower, despite lacking those hard power credentials that the question was about, and despite the fact that, that Brazil gave up its nuclear weapons program over 20 years ago, and yet still you can have a conversation about how South America is becoming a superpower, and that really proves Oscar's point about the new metrics of power. Uh, Ambassador, why don't you respond to that? And, and I'm, I also would like you to say something about the uh, point about the work ethic of uh, people in Brazil and the wider continent <laughs> lacking what Niall, Neil Ferguson called a so-called killer app of uh, the Protestant work ethic. Say something about that, and then I want to hear Rana Mitchell. Well. No, in relation to the militarization, I think it's very fair to say that today, uh, one-sided military intervention is not as possible as it was 100 years ago. It's, uh, 100 years ago is worse than it was 50 years ago. And it's very safe to say that 50 years from now, even 20, it's even going to be more difficult. The world is becoming more balanced, and the, the fact that you have individual military power is no longer as important as it is. We're going to need, as I said, increased uh, capacity of having horizontal relations, much more than vertical relations, which has, have predominated over the past. I think this is a very important element that will create different roles for different countries and will increase the visibility and the presence of, of countries that have the preeminence of being able to dialogue with many other interlocutors. In relation to the work ethic, this is a, is a complex issue, of course. You can ask whether in Europe you have the work ethic of the Chinese. In fact, uh, the Chinese come to say 
that we are not, we don't have another valued currency, you have underworked people. And I heard the Chinese say that. I mean, we work 60 hours a week, you work 35. How can you question our currency? This is not fair. Uh, of, in Latin America, we work much more than 35 hours a week. Of course, it is difficult to balance the cultural elements involved in this question. I'm not very keen on the Catholic versus Protestant issue, although Latin America is divided. Brazil certainly, it's certainly predominant Catholic. But I think there are different cultural influences. The indigenous influences in some countries is very important. They contribute to different type of work ethic. But I can tell you very easily, even within Brazil, we have this discussion between people from Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. And the fact is that <laughs> if you want to have fun, you go to Rio. If you want to work, you go to Sao Paulo. But the fact is that cariocas, as I, work very hard as well. <laughs> I'm very glad you said that, Rodney. Thank you. Rana Mitty, you wanted to come on on the work ethic question. Yes, briefly. Well, first of all, just uh, with all the praise that's been given to Chinese work ethic, I am reminded of a, a, a restaurant I visited in China not that long ago when uh, they uh, we waited for ages and ages and they wouldn't serve us any food. And when we asked why they weren't serving, they said, well, it's dinner time. We're busy. In other yeah. words, with their own meal rather than, uh, than, than, than anyone else's. I would for a moment though suggest that this is, is, is typical. What I think is really important and this is actually, I think, one of these kind of red herrings. The idea that the, there is a sort of religious or ethnic or in some other way culturally divided way of understanding work ethic, I think misses the major point, which is to do with economics. At the moment, the Chinese government is overly, is, is worried that the Chinese people have an overly strong work ethic because at the moment, basically, the Chinese people are producing a very great deal for the export-driven economy and are not consuming nearly enough. So if, as they wish, China is going to have to develop a very powerful new domestic domestic consumer economy to keep that growth rate going. The Chinese people are going to have to learn to play a little bit more and work a little bit less, as well as, of course, have more of a, a, a welfare-driven system that enables them actually not to have to work every hour to make sure that they've got money to pay for hospital or educational or uh, pension-type uh, type bills. So in a sense, I suspect that one of the things that we're going to see in the next 20 years, which will add to China's economic growth is the lessening rather than the increasing of the work ethic in the classic sense and a bit more of a, of a consumption ethic. Uh, just put, put some hands up if we have got more contributions to come. If, while we're waiting for that, sorry. Um, Gideon, why don't you come in on this? Yeah, just just uh, one question that was raised from the floor and the, also in the talks. I mean, the, the big question that people always raise about China is, is uh, an unstable political system. Uh, certainly in America, if you talk about the rise of China, the first thing, maybe the second thing people will say is, yeah, but it's all going to blow up, isn't it? Because uh, this, is, this is not a stable country. And I think they have half a point. I don't think that China has made the political transition that, uh, that, it, that it has to. And I'm sure there is a lot of instability in store for China. Uh, and yet I don't think that is, uh, that should then lead you to the conclusion, say, oh, well, this is kind of some kind of mirage, the Chinese miracle. It certainly isn't that. I mean, this is a country that through Tiananmen Square, through the Asian financial crisis and now the global financial crisis has continued to grow pretty fast. Uh, it's had recessions and so on. And even if there is a very difficult political transition, I don't think it, it will mean that China's suddenly taken off the map geopolitically, not at all. I mean, to give you just finish on a, a comparison, if you look at Germany, uh, you know, its rise began in the middle of the 19th century. Talk about turbulent. They had two world wars, a Great Depression, hyperinflation, etc. They're still a major economic power by 1950. Thank you. Let's uh, take a question there, and we're going to come over here. Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. Hi. I would like to ask Gideon Rockman, in which basis do you uh, argue that Latin America won't even lead intellectually? And does China have any of its universities in its top 20 of the world? Or do they not have violence pro um, problems as well? Thank you. Uh, there's somebody waiting patiently here. Yep, and then it'll be you. Um, hi, my question or comment is about a documentary I saw recently, which was focused on Brazil. And in that documentary, there are two things that came out from it. And one of them was showing schools in Brazil. I don't know if they were British, American, or Brazilian schools, where there were compulsory um, Mandarin lessons, which were taught by teachers um, that were employed by the Chinese government and living and teaching in Brazil. And the second comment was about how uh, local businesses in Brazil, particularly those that supply, incidentally, bikinis, 
were going out of business because of the influx of cheap Chinese goods. And this was, and in fact, that most uh, touristic products in Brazil were actually made in China. So I would like to invite the panel to comment on those two things. Thank you. Uh, somebody's, well, oh, we've got a couple here. Let's, go, is, if you can be quickly, we can get, be quick, we can get all of you in, and then get, if we can get the microphone to the chat, please wait. Uh, that will be it. I yeah. wanted to ask about ambition. The, the US has manifest destiny. Uh, the Chinese think in millennial terms. They're the Middle Kingdom. Indians really want a nuclear bomb. Um, we led the non-aligned nations. Um, does, does Latin America have the ambition? Does, uh, you know, I think not, and that's why they're more fun to have a drink with, but uh, for the purposes of the debate. Thank you. Somebody waiting just behind you, yeah. Um, I don't doubt Latin America's intentions to become a world superpower, and obviously you mentioned the US taking them quite seriously in Obama being there, but Cameron's visited India and China since he's been in power. Um, Europe is keen to do business with China. Africa's looking to China for investment. How do you change people's mentality to encourage them to look west in order for South America to become the 21st century superpower? Thank you. That's um, very, no one else there? Yes, and we've got you. I think it's going to be the last one, and then we're going to bring it back here. Gideon touched on it a second ago. Um, I'm against the resolution. I think the inevitability of the, of the rise of the East is, is um, unassailable momentum. However, there's one crack in the dam for me, and that's a potential or even pending revolution in China as they um, arm their middle classes with higher education and personal wealth and personal property. And I'm surprised the, uh, the affirmative side did not explore and use that argument uh, to a greater degree. Thank you. Um, that's going to be it for questions. What we're going to do now is move to closing speeches, but I'm going to really urge because they were really good questions. I'm going to urge our speakers to address some of those. Gideon, they were some directed specifically at you. Um, uh, we're going to do the speeches in um, reverse order. Um, and just while you're working out that, I'll just give you a refresher on uh, the questions asked. Gideon, you were asked to, uh, well, I'll come to that when I come to you. The question's for you. But most products in Brazil uh, made in China. Does Latin America have the ambition to do this? Isn't it just reality that Europe and Africa are all looking to China? How do you persuade them to look otherwise? And isn't China vulnerable because of pending revolution? And therefore, maybe that gives South America uh, an advantage. Uh, so we're going in reverse order. Uh, any of those you want to address and closing remarks, maximum of really a minute and a half, two minutes, Rana Mitter. Well, let me uh, pick up with the very last point that was made. Um, it's not hard to find out what's going to happen with the Chinese middle classes because they're all around us these days. At the university at which I teach, Oxford, the second biggest national group of students from any country on the undergraduate level is from China. Just a generation ago, it would have been the Republic of Ireland for obvious reasons, uh, geographical proximity. Now UK is number one, but China number two. And I could see that, particularly in theoretical terms, the idea that a growing middle class will necessarily cause a revolution, particularly because of events in North Africa is an attractive one. But that isn't so far the overall message that comes from the Chinese side. Clearly, they're more politically aware in various ways, but that's a different thing from arguing there's going to be an absolute overthrow of the system. And it is probably in that area that the continuing rise of China, as well as of India, and the continuing importance of Japan and the other powers from the Asian side make the case for us. Because in the last resort, we do have here these uh, blocks which have some sort of collective identity, and as someone has said in the audience, an aspiration. Whatever one says about China and India today, it's very clear that they have the intention of making their weight known in global society. If you go to India, I was just in India last week, on the back of any scooter or truck or car which is in front of you in the traffic jam, of which there are many still in, in India, there will be a hand-painted sign saying, my India is great, just next to the sign saying, horn please danger. So this is something that clearly sits in the cultural psyche. I'm not convinced from what I've heard that that yet exists on the Latin American side. I'm less convinced that it's gonna move into cyber space and those other areas where I think these battles are going to be fought and won in the next century. This is not to endorse the rise of China, India, or Japan, to say it is a good or a bad thing. Just as someone has said that at the moment, the weight of the evidence sits there in the end rather than on the side of Latin America. Thank you very much. Um, two housekeeping points. Um, boxes are going around now for you to uh, vote. Uh, it's very obvious if you want to vote uh, for or against them on the slip, but if you are a don't know, please put the entire 
uh, ticket in the ballot box. And those people who are even considering leaving, uh, I, how can you bear the suspense? You've got to wait till 8.30 and you will find out the result of this vote. So don't even think about it. Um, we are going to go to uh, our second. Uh, so we'll, should we have a lock-in? That's uh, Gideon Rackman's very democratic idea to sit you here and force you to vote and stay for the result. Um, perhaps he'll be the next recipient of the Gaddafi Prize for Human Rights, who knows? Um, our second speaker to sum up is uh, Ambassador Jaguaribe. And there was a specific question for you, Ambassador. I think about Brazil, a question you're asking that actually a lot of the products you see in Brazil are made in China. Doesn't that underline China's strength? Yes, well, uh, thank you very much. I think there are many issues related to the, pro the problem of uh, uh, competitiveness of Chinese exports and manufacturers. And in the case of Brazil, there's also the big issue of the overvaluation of the currency, uh, which presents an imbalance between our competitiveness in the commodity agricultural sector and difficulty with coping with the valuation of, the, of our currency in the industrial sector. But this is a structural, uh, this is not a structural issue. We can see the German case, which has a continuous history of valuation of their currency and maintaining their competitiveness. There are possible alternatives to that, but there's no possible alternative to the question I'm going to put to you. you we can do without bikinis, but nobody can do without eating. And eating is continuously going to mobilize the economy of those countries that are, be able, uh, are going to be, able to, to be competitive producers. Latin America and South America in particular are continuing to be the most competitive producers of uh, agriculture in the world, uh, doing away with the subsidy that some country utilize. I think as just a, as a summarization, I believe that Latin America lacks the implacability to become and to will a superpower in the traditional sense of what a superpower is. We don't have the implacability of the culture that's associated with superpowers, but we have the ability to bring and impress the world in different ways, which are going to be increasingly required. And they relate to dialogue, they relate to uh, seduction, they relate to uh, convincing people other than telling them around. Thank you. Thank you very much, offering, thank you. The ambassador offering a different, a modified 21st century definition of what superpower is and saying on that definition, Latin America will be it. Uh, our next speaker, for the, to sum up, Gideon Rachman, the questions that were put specifically to you was what's your evidence for suggesting that Latin or South America can't lead intellectually? And uh, a question put was, does China have uh, a university in the global top 20? And, what, and surely there's violence in those places too. But you'll have other points you want to make um, as well. On, uh, on leading intellectually, now, obviously, I'm not suggesting that there, there won't be major intellectual contributions from individual Latin Americans <coughs> and, uh, and so on. That would be absurd. But I don't think that there is yet, for all that we've heard ideas about the promotion of social democracy, the promotion of dialogue, I don't think there's much of a sense in the rest of the world that there is a distinctive Latin American way that, uh, that people can emulate or learn from, yet people say, oh, you know, there are interesting things going on in Brazil, followers of social welfare reform are interested in what Lula's done and so on, but uh, there is, to be honest, no real global discussion of a Latin American way. By contrast, I think there is considerable interest in the Chinese model. People are conscious that there's an extraordinary story going on there. The Chinese themselves have begun to pick up this talk of a Beijing consensus and try to develop it. So I think that in terms of a continent being identified with a certain way of doing things, there isn't much evidence that, that Latin America is, is, is getting there yet, certainly by comparison to Asia. And in the more conventional uh, intellectual ways, in terms of, as you say, are there, are there Asian universities in the top 20? I'm not sure about the top 20, certainly in the top 50. On the other hand, uh, it is a Chinese ranking, so perhaps, <laughs> perhaps there would be. But, so let's take perhaps a more reliable um, statistic, numbers of engineers. Uh, China is producing, and so is India, huge numbers of, of engineers, computer technicians. If you go to Brazil, uh, you talk to multinationals, it's the one thing they're very, very concerned about. It's hard to find skilled labor for the moment. So I think that these uh, university rankings are picking up on something that is genuine. And to conclude, I think it does all come back in terms of clout, uh, political clout, economic clout, to the size of these economies and the rate at which they're growing. And I read, it must be true, because I read it in The Economist, uh, the, Chi the, Chinese, the Chinese economy is going to be, on current uh, projections, the largest economy in the world by 2019. 
bigger than that of the United States. The Brazilian economy might be the fifth largest economy in the world. We're not really talking about the same thing. Thank you. Uh, last, or next, to make his pitch for your votes, which actually you've already cast. Um, but nevertheless, for the, to uh, speak for the motion uh, in a summing up uh, fashion, Oscar Guardiola Rivera. Let me just quote William Hague. November 2010. Now is the time for Britain to la at last to think afresh about Latin America. By any measure, Latin America matters. For example, 35% of global reserves of fresh water and 25% of the world's cultivable land. 62% of the remaining rainforests in the world are in Latin America. 40% of global biodiversity is in South America. Latin America is the commodity world powerhouse. 13% of oil and growing, 34% of copper, 59% of coffee, 47% of sugar, the sixth larger proven gas reserves in the world. And last but not least, because I hear a lot about the Chinese model. But let me say this. Today, all South American countries enjoy democracy and human rights. Let's leave it at that. Oh. Thank you. Yeah. Just, just, just let me tack on one question to that because it was a question that came from the floor, which is the notion that even if you're right, how is it? You, how, how can you go about persuading? The man mentioned was David Cameron, but also Europe and Africa to look to Latin America rather than the questioner said they are at the moment, rightly or wrongly, looking to China. Just add that onto your remarks. Well, very modestly, you write books about it, <laughs> such as What If Latin America Ruled the World? <laughs> and people like Gideon uh, very kindly recommend them to their readers in the Financial <laughs> Times. That's how you change uh, people's minds. Let me finish with this. Everywhere I go, I'm, a I'm asked, OK, what if Latin America ruled the world? And I always half-jokingly answer, well, we would all dance better. <laughs> That's how you change people's minds. Very nice. Um, our next summer-upper is uh, the uh, speaking against the motion, Bill Emmett. Well, the first thing I would say is um, that something of the atmosphere of some of the questions and of the comments up here on our panel have suggested that actually it's still all about us which countries our leaders go to, whether we in intervene in them, whether we will in invest. The fact is that the 21st century is not all about us. It's no longer something that should, or I hope will, revolve all around us. It should revolve around a hell of a lot of countries in the world. Above all, I believe it will and I hope it will, revolve an enormous amount among the part of the world that contains more than half of the world's population, namely Asia. The growth and development of Asia over the past century, but especially uh, since 1945, has been extraordinary and a wonderful period of human and political development. Most important, it's been a period of steady democratization. In 1945, there were no democracies in Asia, unless I've forgotten one. Now, many of the countries of Asia are democracies, and they keep on democratizing bit by bit as dictatorships move into a more mature, affluent period and democratization has happened. In South Korea, in Taiwan, in 1998 in Indonesia, in a way the Asian equivalent of Egypt, where popular overthrow, country dominated by a family, led by a military which was considered the only working institution in the country, became um, a democracy after some troubles, after difficulties, but it did become a democracy. So with that background, why would be, we be pessimistic about the prospects in China, the prospects in other Asian countries to develop in the same way? The experience so far suggests that they move in a positive direction. 
Latin America, we should certainly hope, we should have great optimism that Latin America will succeed, will grow, will develop. But let's be clear, the growth and success of Latin America is extremely recent. We have something called the Latin American debt crisis in my first decade as a journalist. And at that time, we would no, no one would ever have spoken of Latin America as a potential future superpower. When we look at Latin America today, and we say that everyone's a democracy, we might remember Cuba. We might look at Venezuela and wonder about the human rights all over. And we might look at the military saber rattling that's taken place in recent years between Colombia and Venezuela and wonder whether we should be absolutely certain that this is the continent of peace and of benign development. I hope it will be. I hope that Latin America will succeed. But above all, I hope that the world will progress in a multipolar way, as has been discussed. We shouldn't look west. We shouldn't look east. We should look everywhere. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have in my hand a piece of paper. But before I reveal what's inside it, I'll close I'll, the last word. Uh, and perhaps, um, Parah Khanna, you might address the question about whether Latin America has the ambition to be a superpower. That was a question that mm -hmm. came from the floor. But a closing minute from you. Great. Well, we have made the case that South America should be considered a superpower based on its economy, its resources, and the fact that it is peaceful, its demographics as well. With an economy that is, in fact, as large as China's, how could we really rule it out? It's impossible not to take into account all of its latent resources and the fact that it is, through its ambition, beginning to actualize them. And in fact, on the question of whether or not or why the world isn't looking more to Latin America, the fact is that that's exactly what is happening. Everyone wants what Latin America has, and that's precisely what the ambassador's point was. Most certainly the U.S. is, through the relocation of outsourcing, so much into Latin America. So the world is looking very much to, to South America today. Secondly, regime type really matters. Normally in geopolitics, you're very agnostic about whether a country is a democracy or a dictatorship, but that doesn't mean that that doesn't matter because authoritarian regimes are in fact highly unstable, hence the question from the floor. The fact is South America is largely democratic and stable and possesses a strong capacity for social integration, the term that that the ambassador used. Meanwhile, in Asia, you find a tremendous amount of demographic instability. Size, demographic size, is not always a blessing. If you look at India and China, they both have a, a tremendous amount of difficulty, for different reasons, in managing such overwhelming populations. And there's very little evidence to suggest that they are going to be able to, in China's case, grow uh, rich before it grows old, and in India's case, to employ such a large population. We cannot ignore the factor of containment, internal and external, in, in the Asian case. The United States is trying very hard to constrain China's rise, and Asian powers are really hedging against it through their military, uh, re, uh, military uh, expenditures. But most of all, we should think not just in terms of continents, but also culture. Not just about South America, but really the West as a whole. Not just the United States and Europe, which together form a true alliance, but including South America within that in a real strategic triangle of the West, a collective, peaceful superpower constellation. In fact, it could very well be South America's ambition that will help revive the moribund West. Thank you very much. Thank you. So did the arguments on my right prevail or did those on the left triumph? Those, uh, just to remind you of the vote before the debate, as we came in, those for the motion that yes, we should look west, not east, uh, there were 236 for, 279 against, and 201 don't knows. I can tell you the don't knows have now gone down from 201 to 49. So where do those 150 go? Those for the motion that yes, we should look west, not east, South, South America will be the 21st century superpower, 204. Those against it, 447. So the motion has been soundly defeated. Hold on. I'm sure you're going to want to, uh, as we lick our wounds, those who've been defeated, I'm sure you're going to want to join me in thanking our stellar lineup of speakers, Oscar Gardelli Rivera, Roberto Jaguribe, Paolo Bill Emmett, 
Gideon Rackman, Rana Mitter. Thank you all very much.